before we get into that, I just want to make sure we are all caught up on the same page of some of the very last events of the book of Jonah, especially in chapter 3. God finally got Jonah's little behind to go to Nineveh after a lot of effort, and he preaches a five-word sermon in Hebrew. I know the translation in English is a little longer. I know some people in this church are like, why can't our pastor do that? Five-word sermon? That would be all right. But the king and the cattle and the sackcloth put on sackcloth and ashes and beg for mercy, and God changes his mind. God, or should I say God changes God's mind, decides not to bring calamity upon Nineveh. Upon this, God gets really angry. Paraphrasing Jonah in chapter 4, Jonah says to God, See, I knew this was going to happen. I knew you were a merciful God, and I knew you weren't going to punish them after all. That's it. I'm out. Take me now. Literally, that's what Jonah says, right? Jonah was so looking forward to seeing Nineveh overthrown. So looking forward to seeing them suffer. He became very upset when it didn't happen. But wait, isn't that what God would want to happen all along? Isn't God loving and merciful and wanting everyone to turn back to God so they can experience the peace and the forgiveness and the reconciliation and the sense of who they are and who they're becoming to seek justice and not just just us. I mean, how beautiful is what happened at Nineveh? I mean, we're going to talk about Jonah because the book is named after him, but think about what happened in this city. I mean, this is what many Christians around the world would call a revival. Have you ever heard that term? This is a revival. The Spirit just takes over the whole city from the king to the cows to the common people. But Jonah's reaction? So this got me thinking. I mean, what if Jonah's main issue wasn't disobedience? Maybe it was disdain. Or maybe even hatred for the Assyrians, for the Ninevites. I mean, Jonah really, really, really wanted to see them get smoked. And that being said, Jesus, Jonah wasn't crazy for feeling that way. I mean, the Assyrians were Israel's enemy. For example, in 722 BC, we don't exactly know if that's before or after the time Jonah was written, the army of Assyria pillaged the kingdom of northern Israel, laid siege to Samaria, and dragged every last citizen into captivity. That's a historical fact. But Jonah, but God wasn't inviting Jonah to take his cues from Nineveh was God. God was inviting Jonah to take his cues from God, from God's love for the people, for the animals, God's love even for the king and those in power. And of course, the general human tendencies of pride and rebelliousness are present in Jonah, but I, whether I was meditating on this all week, I mean, it's very possible that this isn't just general pride and rebelliousness. This has everything to do with how Jonah feels about the Ninevites. It reveals one of the main ways selfishness and fear manifest themselves in the human heart. In prejudice. In hatred. In racism. I mean... Even though they had a terrible reputation, the Ninevites, that is, even though they're from a different religion, a different culture, maybe even a different skin color, God loves Nineveh. And Jonah, until the very last verse of that same book, just can't get on board. He's got too much prejudice. Maybe that's why the original Hebrew text has a marking to indicate after that question that was read that we should pause after God asks Jonah is it right for you to be angry 
Is it right for you to be angry? One of the books Wes, Renee, and I used to get ready for our Bible study on Jonah was from Priscilla Scharer, who asks, who points out, when God asks the questions in the scriptures, it's not for God's benefit. <laughs> That's really funny, right? God already knows the answer. Reflecting upon God's questions requires us to do a soul search that may unearth heart issues we did not formally recognize. Therefore, helping us see in ourselves what God seeks for us to uncover. So it's only appropriate in this time of repentance called Lent that we let Jonah 4 check ourselves. Amen? Check us on our journey to be truly anti-racist and committed to real reconciliation in real time in our world. The Bible makes it clear, especially in John, 1 John 4, how can we say we love God if we can't love our neighbor? How can we say we love God who we often cannot see in the one we can see? And this really brought it home for me. The truly remarkable author, Anne Lamott. Has anybody ever read any Anne Lamott? She is, as the kids used to say 12 years ago, fire. <laughs> she wrote the following. You can safely assume that you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people you do. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? And it's so true. You can safely assume you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people you do. So our God is a big and loving God. God loves us, but God is not okay with our prejudice. God is not okay with the systems and structures that elevate some while crushing others. So when God asks Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? What does Jonah do? You can look at it in the bulletin if you'd like. Well, he says nothing. <laughs> he has no answer for that. But do you remember what he does? This is so interesting to me. Instead of storming back to his hometown, or instead of staying in the city, I mean, if Jonah's heart was right, wouldn't he want to enjoy the transformation that's just happened in the city? Wouldn't it be awesome? But to me, he's probably thinking, based on his behavior here, I know God's not going to actually let this city off. Is God? Let's just hope I can catch God doing the right thing after all, which would mean smoking these fools. So what does Jonah do? He sets up a stakeout <laughs> outside the city, and he's just going to wait and see, hoping that something really bad happens. And nothing bad happens to Nineveh. Instead, this is the funny part, right? God ordains, that's the Hebrew, in uh, the actual Hebrew, the same word we use for ordain, a plant and a worm. First, the plant gives shade on his stakeout. And let's just review here. I mean, it's just hard to track how messed up Jonah behaves. And of course, it reflects all of us and our, our hangups. A whole evil city turns to God and repents of their sin. Bad. God brings up one little plant over his head in the hot sun. That's good. And, but God is an appointing, anointing, calling, equipping, and empowering God. Amen? Amen? And God is not done ordaining in the book of Jonah. So God ordains the worm to attack the bush so it withers. Some would call this a parable within a parable, right? That the symbol, within the symbolism of the entire book, here's an object lesson for Jonah to try to get the point. But let it be known. If God can ordain a plant and a worm, that must mean that God can ordain you and me, even if you're not up here wearing a stole. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, consider yourself ordained. Can share God's love. Yes. So then Jonah really feels the heat, right? Because the worm is eating away at the plant. And now he's got a second thing to be mad and upset about, right? He was mad about Nineveh, now he's mad about the plant. 
And again, and this is where I just can't skirt past this. As a pastor, Jonah again says, it is better for me to die than to live. And I am getting to the close. But I just, this chapter had so much in it. I'm just trying to hit the big points. So this is an important segue, though, about Jonah. Because not once but twice, he says, it would be better for me to die than live. It's really important to surround people who are struggling with the love, support, and resources they may need. And of course, the person at one point needs to take that step to accept the opportunities there are for therapy, for love. It's painful. All of us know people who have been going through something or have gone through something like this. Suicide thoughts. And one of my prayers for everyone who might be in that situation is to gain some perspective, right? Past their own selves, past their own situation. As it has been said, don't let your worst day be your last. And as badly as Jonah presents in this final chapter, there is actually something really good about what he is doing. It's actually something he's not doing. And it is stated so beautifully by one of the best books I've ever read, Philip Yancey, another awesome author. I know I'm just dropping all these authors today, but I needed some help on this one. Philip Yancey wrote a book, Disappointment with God. Have you ever felt disappointed? Have you ever felt even disappointed with God? I mean, I totally can't recommend this book enough. He writes, throw at God your grief. Your anger, your doubt, your bitterness, your betrayal, your disappointment. So God can absorb them all. As often as not, the spiritual giants of the Bible are shown contending with God. They prefer to go away limping like Jacob rather than shut God out. In this respect, the Bible prefigures a tenet of modern psychology. You can't really deny your feelings or make them disappear So you might as well express them. And God can deal with every human response, save one. He cannot abide the presence I sadly fall back on too many times and attempt to ignore him or treat him as though he does not exist. Even in the midst of Jonah's struggle and our struggle, it's important to treasure the fact that God does not stop loving Jonah. God does not stop loving us. God does not stop finding ways to get our attention like God got Jonah's attention so we can grow into a greater understanding of God's grace and love for all. And to Jonah's credit, even though he's sitting under that now withered plant, boiling in resentment, look what he's not doing. He's not running. The book ends with him just sitting there in the presence of God. And then, of course, the book ends on a cliffhanger. We're all on the edge of our seat waiting to see what Jonah will do next. And the book just seems to end. But maybe that's because God is waiting on the edge of God's seat, waiting to see what we will do with this word that's come from God through Jonah to us. So are we going to stay in conversation with God, waiting to see what God has for us, even in the midst of pain and disappointment? Are we going to take time to listen to God and how we get to participate in God's plan powered by a mighty love to reconcile and redeem the world. God's plan to unfurl God's love throughout history and throughout creation is so big that it's going to take everybody, prophets, kings, big fish, Ninevites, cattle, plants, worms, and us. So as our next hymn affirms, let's not just squeeze underneath one leafy plant, 
Let's spend time in the garden. The garden of God's love. Maybe even Terry there. Come on up, musicians. So we can let the extravagant love of God sink deep into our hearts.